Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Above Par Golf Show. Today, I've got a very special guest, a man that needs no introduction. It's Mr. Mark Immelman, golf broadcaster, golf coach, author. Is there anything you can't do in golf, Mark? <laughs> play right now Alex uh, my, my golf game itself is in tatters but uh, no golf has been so good to me and my family through our life and it's a thrill to be with you man thanks for having me no I really appreciate your time coming on so we've been treated to, to some really good golf recently I know you were out in Detroit um, we've had two playoff wins back to back have you been enjoying yourself we were working overtime I was counting last night with a friend um, got home late Sunday night and I head off to uh, the Quad Cities for the John Deere tomorrow morning. Um, so hooked up with a friend, we cooked out and we were just chatting. And I was like, we've went 13 extra holes the last two weeks, mm -hmm. which is crazy. I mean, normally if you do a, a, a playoff, it's one, two, maybe three at best. Yep. You know, uh, Connecticut, the travelers went on forever, felt like. And we were right on the heels of it getting too dark and they finished and then I got the sense Sunday afternoon there that, hold on, this could be the same sort of a deal. And uh, I was somewhat surprised that Troy Merritt missed that four, five, six footer up the hill because he had been putting so well. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's so much pressure uh, at that level at that time of the game that uh, I probably, you know, sort of succumbed to it a little bit. But again, mm -hmm. 13 holes worth of extra golf has been, it's been fun. It's ruined travel plans, but it's been fun. Yeah, I think we've been really lucky as well because we've had all the light we want during the night to just carry on as long as we wanted to do it. Yeah. And um, uh -huh. for me, it, was, it wasn't only that, it was about Cam Davis as well. I mean, it, it looked like, I mean, he had three, four puts in a row to finish things off. It looked like he was just never going to get it done. Well, yeah, I mean, he's such, he's such a talented golfer and he just hits the thing so well. I mean, he's a generational ball striker. Like that three iron he hit into the second to last playoff hole, the par five. The par five. Mm -hmm. That thing was towering and it was smashed right out of the center. And and I watched the shot and I'm like, there's only a handful of guys in the world that can do that. But you know what? Those are only as good as the putts that you make thereafter. And sure. um, you know, getting your first win, it's it's a milestone. So, you know, when you got 10, 15 feet to win. You practice those ones on the greens as a kid and, you know, in practice to prep, prepare. But if you haven't been there, you know, because winning at the smaller tours is one thing, but winning on the PGA Tour or the European Tour, that's kind of like the pinnacle of the game, you know. And then, yeah, of course, I mean, above, that, above that, the majors. And so you got that chance and you, you want to direct your focus and you want to hit a proper putt. But there's a whole lot on the line. So, yeah, he didn't convert, but in the end it worked out and maybe that'll that'll uh, set him up for future success. Yeah, I mean, you talked about it there, just winning on a regular tour is one thing, but PGA and never mind under the pressure of, of playoff um, playoff holes, it's his first win, obviously, that he was trying to achieve. And you talk about that second shot there in the par five, and he did that immediately after that incredible second shot of Troy Merritt. And then he went inside of him and, and managed to get it in there. So yeah, it was incredible, great first win for him. And, and you said you're working down at the John Deere next week or this weekend. Uh, how do you yeah. see that going? Who are you looking out for that weekend? Um, you know, it's the usual suspects, but, you know, with the Open Championship next week, it's sort of thinned the field a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of the stars are, if not playing in the Scottish Open this week, already traveling to uh, to the to the UK. Um, so you, you've got a few guys. Brian Harmon always plays very well there. Um, there's, you know, I would look for folks that played this well this last week to play well next week again. And then of course, you know, the, the Zach, it's like the Zach Johnson, Steve Stricker open that, that John Deere classic, because, you know, even though they advanced in years, they just play the golf course so well. Yeah. And Deere run is a fun place. You don't have to be long. Uh, and if you putt well, you can score around there. So normally in the summertime, it's quite sort of soft receptive from summer thunderstorms. Um, so it'll be a scoring fest. Uh, it'll be, you know, sometimes it spits out fun winners like Jordan Spieth, who's holding bunker shots and stuff, or <laughs> or Bryson and, and that. But, you know, I look forward to a fun week. You know, the week prior to the Open, there's a lot to play for still. Yeah, you, you talked a little bit there about, um, you, you normally say in the plays that maybe played well the previous weekend. I, I mean, I'm not really a betting man, but I get involved in terms of who I think is going to win. And I know you've done a little bit of work on the first cup with uh, uh, Rick and, and those guys. 
So what do you think is more important for the players? Is it maybe a player that has got good previous on that particular cause? Or would you prefer to, to say that you'd be backing maybe somebody that's been playing well the recent few weeks? Because I think they're the main two things that I always look at when I am going to have a little bet on, on somebody to win. Well, that's a really good question, Alex. And to be truthful, um, you know, I they ask me my take just for my knowledge of the players. I'm certainly no betting expert. Um, <laughs> But there's a big thing for horses for courses. You know, if you get there as a golfer, if you get to a place where, one, you've had good results, so the vibes are good, and two, the golf course sort of fits your eye, maybe the way it shapes or the way it flows. You know, there's another thing. There's this weird sort of an element that's not quantifiable where you can just pick lines on the greens. You see lines well, and you get the speed of the greens automatically because on a lot of these sorts of events, it essentially becomes a putting contest in the end. Uh, and mm -hmm. so if you've played well there before, you come back and you remember lines and you've hit tee shots and you you just feel comfortable, you know? And um, so I think that is, I, I, I always look for guys who've had past success, and but then you can't discount form. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the PGA Tour, the European Tour, it's a momentum place. If you want to see who's yeah. going to play well, go and look who's been playing well. Exactly. And, and, I typically look in like four week windows, three to four week windows, because if you're traveling and you're getting different weather in terms of technique, you know, stuff starts waning after a little bit, maybe fatigue, playing in poor weather, whatever the case might be. So if a player is in like their second to third week of like a stretch of golf and they've been playing well, I'll keep an eye on them. So, you know, sure. I'm not sure if Cam Davis is in the field, but he might be worth a, a flutter. Um, I, I've personally got my own Brian Harmon a little bit. I know he had the week okay. off, but he's won there before. He has been playing well over the last little while. Um, so, you know, it's tough. If I was really good at it, I probably would be sitting on a beach gambling every week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's, uh, there's, there's equal cases to be made for both of those. You know, good mm -hmm. form. And if you played well there before, in my opinion. I think it's just like that muscle memory, isn't it, of going back to somewhere where you've got the happy memories, you know you've done it before, you know you've played well before, you just get that feeling of confidence straight away. So mm -hmm. I think it's a, it plays a big part in it. And um, so you, you said there as well before you guys are doing overtime as the broadcasting. I'm interested to know a little bit more about what you guys do. What is your setup, let's say, from start to finish at the weekend um, to make sure everything's prepared, seeing out the weekend and finishing everything off? Because... You know, you guys probably don't get enough credit. People just think you turn up and pick the microphone up and talk about golf when, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of your work and the videos that you've done and you talk about how hard that preparation is and, and to get everything perfect across the weekend. Well, a lot of the uh, credit needs to go to the technical crew, you know, the camera folks, the production folks, the audio folks even. Um, they do yeoman's work and they, they are so much longer than what we are. But a typical day for me, um, a CBS show will come on in the afternoon, unless it's a major championship. We'll come on at uh, three o'clock local, and it's like a three to four hour show. So in the morning, I'll wake up and I'll go and grab coffee and breakfast and, you know, hopefully try and get some exercise just to clear my head. And then uh, there's preparations done. And we've got some folks that help us out that forward us notes. And then you just kind of build a storyline for who you likely to follow and our producer will sort of tell us the morning or the night before who my on course group will be and so you just start to look around for insights information on them um, make little notes in my yardage book um, look for how they've been playing um, and and without sort of being like just a guy who spits data at you all all the time then i, I look for correlations between okay he's been driving the ball well and he hits the thing from right to left and there's seven tee shots move from right to left for argument's sake. So I look for trends like that, if, if you will. Yeah. And then I head to the golf course, I'll have a little lunch and then go to the driving range, go and try and catch up with the players you're following, you know, watch them a little bit and warm up, go and look in their golf bag a little bit and see if there's club changes, talk to their caddy, you know, just get a little insight as to what's been going on if I haven't seen them or followed them. And then it's showtime. And then yeah. 
go time, all the notes you've made sort of go out the window because golf yeah. is so material. <laughs> and, and then all, and then you might get moved because someone else is playing well. Um, so it's it's a lot of preparation, but the prep is more for if stuff goes wrong. You know, if sure. if things are going well, you're reacting and responding to what's happening in front of um, you at the time. And, and my job as an on-course guy is not to tell you what you see. It's sort of to tell you what's not on the graphic or or mm -hmm. not visible on your TV monitor. So when I'm on course, I'm watching them between shots. I'm watching interactions between player and caddy. I'm watching condition changes, you know, all those sorts of things that mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily be able to see from the television. And, and if I'm doing my job well, you'll hear me sort of saying, well, I might give you a yardage, but it won't be the yardage to the flag. It might be a yardage that you have to hit to cover up slope or, mm -hmm. you know, if the wind is swirling, there's something that is untellable by your pictures. And then, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll try and catch up with the players during the round too, because, you know, sometimes they're funnies you can share and sometimes, you know, you can see that they're struggling mentally or emotionally. So mm -hmm. it's all that sort of stuff. So as I say, the notes in my yardage book, sometimes I use them, but not very often. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you just have to do it on the fly, I imagine. Yeah. Which is the toughest part. So, I mean, you obviously do a lot in golf, not only the broadcasting, but you're a golf coach. Um, you, Like I said, you're an author now. Which part of your different roles do you enjoy the most? What gives you the most pleasure? You know, Alex, deep down, I'm a golf instructor. So I still love... Uh, teaching golf but i'll be honest the broadcast element of it all now is is certainly the most fun to me it's a sacrifice because there's a lot of time away from home you know especially during this covid will be on almost i hope on the back end of this covid pandemic but last year when we brought golf back um they were we were in bubbles the entire time and we were essentially going from one event to the other so there was there was a lot of time away from home which was a sacrifice and that wasn't so great, but I love the game. I love the broadcasting. I love being close to the game at its highest level. You know, to see the most talented golfers playing their best is a thrill. Um, so I still love teaching. I, I love writing about golf because it's like an extension of, of what I see and it's still some teaching in a way. But the broadcast of it all for me is, is, is the fun part. Yeah. What's some of the best moments you've had then as a as a broadcaster? What's the best moment or best shot, whatever it may be, that you've that you've experienced on the course? <laughs> well, I guess there were there've been lots, but I guess I'll go with the two that spring to mind. Um, I've seen hundreds of fantastic shots because <laughs> I'll be honest with you, there's certain times that when these guys are adrenalized and they're at full flight and they're the most talented group of golfers in the world. They sometimes hit shots that I've got to bite my tongue that I don't say some sort of an expletive to go, holy, you know, whatever, this is, yeah. this is so good. Um, but probably the most memorable was when I worked the tour championship. I, the time blurs, but it was when Tiger and Rory were coming down the stretch. Mm -hmm. And Tiger won, and it was sort of his comeback. And then... They were walking down the 18th hole and I was out in front and my daughter, in fact, was there. This was prior pre pandemic and she was spotting for me. She was getting yardages and stuff. And I, I, I was up toward the green sort of set, looking to set up the third shots. And I looked back and it's a downhill par five. And I just saw the crowd streaming behind mm -hmm. the players. Yeah. And it was sort of like the, they do at the open championship. And then yeah. the place was electric. And then all of a sudden, the folks between Tiger and Rory and the green decided, screw this, we want to be involved. And they broke through the ropes. So the next uh -huh. thing, it's like this massive humanity. And then I'm 30, 40 yards from the green. And my daughter, Isabel, is looking at a yardage plate. And all of a sudden, the folks at the green start crossing over. And I, I say to her, come over here. So we just stood together. Mm -hmm. And the folks just surrounded us, surrounded the greens. Tiger and Rory break through. Um, and I remember Izzy, Isabel, saying to me, why are they doing this, Dad? And I was like, they're having fun. You know, I didn't know what to say. And so it was so loud and so raucous. 
I just said to my producer on the talk back, I'm like, just leave me out of these calls. There's too much noise. Who knows yeah. what's going to come through my, my microphone right now. And Tiger hit his birdie putt up there and it was only like a couple, three inches to win. And he got over it and this massive crowd just fell silent. And then you felt like he was milking it because just for a second, he waited. And then he knocked it in. Mm -hmm. And then he raised his arms and the place just erupted. And, and so for me, that was, that was special. Um, and then I called Rory shooting 64 at Bay Hill to win, which is probably the best competitive round I've seen. Even better than the 59 I called of Justin Thomas's in, uh, in Hawaii when he won. Mm -hmm. And then we were at the PGA with Phil this year, with Phil winning in South Carolina. And, you know, on such a difficult golf course in the time in which we are a 51 year old guy pulling off the miraculous was, it was also pretty special. So those sort of, those four are sort of at the top of my head, you know, JT's 59, Rory 64 and Tiger and Phil. And so there's been lots, but, but those ones are sort of top of mind. Yeah. I think that Phil moment was kind of the first time we've seen that happen for a long time in terms of the whole crowd where they just come in and they follow them yeah. And obviously Phil and Brooks broke through and, and it just went, went crazy as well. I mean, that, that was incredible. What, what do you put his success down to even at this late age? Like what, what do you see in Phil Mickelson that's, that's allowing him to keep going and, and shocking people with, with, uh, uh, with an amazing like that? Yeah, I, I would say mindset. He's ever inquisitive, Phil. He's, there's always something to learn or something to get better at. Um, he's got a youthful energy about him that's unbelievable for someone who's 51 he's been around for so long so many wins yet he's still got an energy to get up and work hard and practice and get in shape i mean look he has a guy 51 who's in the best physical shape that he's ever been mm. um and so there's that so it's the discipline of it behind the scenes uh, there's the energy to be able to get up and work hard still he doesn't need the money <laughs> no. um and and then it's, it's the, I would say the fact that he's escaped injury bar the um, psoriatic arthritis he's been struggling with, but, but he hasn't had major injury. So he's, he's had a longevity about him and, 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 and that's, and then building on that, Phil just does Phil. He's never really tried to change who he is. He's modified his technique, but if you look at footage, it still sort of looks the same. He might feel different. So, so he's been true to himself. He's a tremendously hard worker, but, but he's, he's, he's like a child at heart. You know, he's, mm -hmm. he's learning all of the time and he's full of fun. I mean, golf is never a grind for Phil Mickelson, and I think that's, that's crucial. Yeah, he just seems like he still has that same love for the game that he had in his younger days and the same the same hunger. Um, it's just, you know, it's incredible. It would have been interesting to see what he might have done if he wasn't partnered against Tiger for so many years. <laughs> it's true. I mean, uh, Tiger, Phil, VJ, all of that crowd, Retief Husson to a certain extent, they were, people forget, you know, we they were the big five at one stage. Those guys were sort of dominant with Woods mm -hmm. being the, the high water mark. Yeah. Um, but you're right, Phil, well, Ernie's got four runners up in majors, all to Phil, uh, all to mm -hmm. Tiger, pardon me. Mm -hmm. And he's got his share of major championships, but all of those guys could would likely have had more if it wasn't for Tiger Woods. Yeah. And I didn't mention in your intro there, but of course you've got your podcast now that's called On The Mark. Um, how's that been going? Have you been enjoying that experience? God, we're in our sixth season of it. Yeah, it, it's, mm -hmm. it started... Um, because the tour came to me, I was part of their radio crew back then, and and they said to me, "We want to do on demand. Would you do a podcast?" And I was like, "Gosh, sure. How do you do a podcast?" <laughs> and and so it started as like a magazine show. Um, and then I, I was like, well, "What are you thinking? I mean, you're a golf teacher. Why don't you just come at it from that angle?" And then <laughs> yeah, when we pivoted to the golf instruction side is when it started to gain some traction. And I mean, we shucks, there's like. It's been 4 million downloads in 125 mm -hmm. countries around the world. Um, got so had some great guests. Um, and the, the, the challenge now is just to keep it fresh. But I, I love it because, again, my bent deep down as an instructor and as a young kid growing up in South Africa, 
the only way I learned was from a club pro and from golf magazines. There wasn't much TV back then. No, of course. And, uh, and then I became a golf teacher and I was good. I taught a few good players and, but it was never the cover of magazine guys, sort of a guy. And so maybe I didn't get the recognition that was warranted. So I, I promised myself that if I ever had a voice, I would give other young instructors a, a platform. And yeah. that's what this On The Mark podcast allows. I mean, our, our, our mandate is to find great minds and to expose them to audiences wherever. So for a kid in South Africa, the UK, wherever it might be, some remote place who maybe doesn't have a, or can't afford a golf teacher, I'm like, mm-hmm. hey, free podcast, download, have a listen to what they have to say. So, so its purpose is to bring minds to golfers and to expose bright minds to golfers. And so it's it's been successful at that. And 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 folks have improved through the podcast so i think that's why it's still it's still thriving yeah and i mean i've got a lot of kind of audience that are amateur golfers that would be watching this now so as a golf instructor um what sort of advice would you give to amateur golfers what are the more common mistakes that you see in in a in a golf swing for an amateur well before you get to the golf swing i would say the common mistake is that a lot of golfers have got their heads on swivels all the time and it even happens on the PGA Tour where you're looking over your shoulder to see who's playing well. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, which instructor is he working with or what is he working on? Or, and the next thing you end up deviating from what you can do. So I would say with someone you trust or by yourself, if you feel informed enough, get yourself a really good assessment of who you are, what your strengths and your weaknesses are. And in the interests of improving your weaknesses, don't ever forego your strength because your strength is kind of what you're gonna to go to when the pressure is up. And it's one thing to hit the ball great on the range, but it's another to hit the ball great when the pressure is up because that's the ultimate measure of your golf swing. Mm-hmm. And I find too many golfers, because you know golf is strange when you're starting, the incremental improvements are quite great. And, mm-hmm. and you learn one thing and you find this huge you know, increase in performance, but the better you get, the more it becomes elimination of mistakes and they find little adjustments. And so the mindset tends to go from positive to like, I've got to cut out errors. Mm -hmm. And so the good golfers then, they're so keen on improving weakness that then they disregard their strength. And then you see golfers play their way into slumps because they're trying to be better. So I would mm. say that's the big one. It's kind of mental and disciplinary, but it's a big deal because all the spring work in the world will amount to nothing if you're working on the wrong thing. For sure. Or if you're working on something that really isn't going to stand you in good stead when when you're out there playing. Yeah. And how much do you kind of teach the mentality versus what they're doing physically when you're, for example, teaching a student regularly? How, how much time are you focusing on the mental side of the game as opposed to the physical side what's what's the sort of balance that you like to keep uh i i would say well that's a that's a good question it's hard to answer because you know when i'm giving you a lesson and we're working on something physical we're focusing on the physical elements of it we, you know mm-hmm. we're like talking about feels and drills and all these sorts of things that will help you to sort of learn that motor pattern but the truth of it is that the motor pattern comes from inside your head Mm-hmm. And if you can get your mind clear and get your focus driven and, and be singular about what you do and, and have your understanding good and have your, your knowledge of the concept good and all those sorts of things, then the physical element, I think, starts to come a little easier. So I, I would say all of my lessons are very physical, but they're very mental at the same time. And when I say mental, I'm not trying to like lift you up and be positive. I certainly will if things aren't going well. You know, we'll, we'll talk in... in, in in, in, in uplifting tones versus in critical tones. But people got to realize that everything you're working on comes from your control center right here. Mm-hmm. So you've got you to be clear of mind and clear of thought and clear of intention. And, and you'll find that if, if you listen to my podcast, we have a number of different guests across the spectrum because I'm very, I, my belief is very holistic when it comes to golf improvement. Sure. And looking into the future then, have you got anything else kind of planned in golf that you want to do, that you want to achieve? Is there anything else on the radar that you're looking at? Yeah, I want to start trying trying to play. So I played twice (laughs) this game, it's been horrendous. So I want to try and get my game back to respectable levels. 
uh, that'll happen in the fall a little bit. Um, but as, as far as the, the broadcasting goes, you know, I'm, uh, it's arguably at the top of the pile, um, you know, with CBS and, and being such a preeminent golf broadcasting crew. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's incredible. I still, you know, I still marvel at that. I never saw myself here. Um, and then from the podcast point of view, we, we morphing now into more video podcast, vodcast sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And because like I've had Nick Faldo on one time and, you know, Nick is very auditory and he's obviously got a great mind. And I was yep. interviewing him and we were talking about things he did well when he was playing well. And you heard him make these sounds and he was actually, I could hear him making practice swings as he was describing this. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, people need to see this sort of stuff. So we, we're trying to go that way so we can have the visual element to some guy or some girl describing to you what they did or what they do or how, how they can help you. So mm -hmm. that's kind of where we're going there. And then over the break time, yeah, over the, uh, over our winter, I'm going to probably sit down and, and, and you know start writing a little bit again just kind of penning my thoughts i'm going to go through all of our podcasts and 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 sort of pick maybe the 20 great just golf tips maybe do something like that and and mm -hmm. then see where things go from there yeah well it's funny you should mention that about um about nick because i was listening to one of your latest episodes the other day on spotify um i think it was is it alex Trujillo? he pronounces his name yeah, were, yeah, yeah. Were, yeah and you were talking about the driver and you started relating it to your watch and i was listening mm -hmm. to it on spotify and i was like i really want to see this actually and i didn't yeah. realize that you actually had the episodes on youtube as well so then i switched over to youtube and started to watch it on there and i could see you then demonstrating yeah. the the thing with your watch so yeah it's an interesting point i think that's um it's definitely going to be the new thing it's really good to see that visual element rather than, than just the audio well, I mean, you you just look at the social media elements of it, you know, Instagram and these sorts of picture things are a lot more popular than all of the Twitters and the Facebooks and such. You, you add a picture to something and then it, it's like almost the path of least resistance, but pictures tell a thousand words, you know. And so mm -hmm. what I might in the communication here, if someone's listening, they might see something and how I'm demonstrating that I have not necessarily verbalized. So. So it's the, adding the videos and the pictures to stuff to me is, is is awfully helpful. Yeah. And just before I let you go then, obviously it's a couple of weeks away, but will you be going down to the Open? Uh, no, it's going to be a week no. off for me. Um, <laughs> so my family and I, it's been, a little bit, it's been a big run through the summer, so we're going to have a little staycation at home. I'm going to catch up on a few errands around the house. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be waking up early in the morning to watch golf, no doubt. I will be <laughs> up for the start of the NBC broadcast with coffee in hand, because I love I love the Open. I mean, mm -hmm. the times that I've been have been so special. And when I've been over there working with golfers, and so I hanker back to time, to the time that I lived in in London. Um, so I'll be I'll, I'll be enjoying the Open on TV, but I'll be at home. Any any early thoughts on on who you think might get it done? <laughs> you know, Royal St George is such a tough place to handicap a golfer because just the way it plays. You know the a lot of the fairways are crowned and balls sort of roll off into the rough. And there's, there's a, for a Lynx golf course, there's quite a bit of elevation change around the place between those sand dunes. So I don't know, uh, shucks. You, you can always go with favorites around there, but it, it tends to, it tends also to produce winners that you don't really expect. Mm -hmm. So, so as far as I know right now, I'm like, oh, goodness, I really don't know. But I'll tell you yeah. one, one person that I've got really got high expectations for is John Rahm because he plays Lynx golf well. He's mm -hmm. coming off a huge win in the US Open. His confidence is riding really high. And so uh, I, I expect him to be around. Yeah, he looks like he's going to be he's going to be doing more than just winning that US Open. It was just incredible. But does it look like he's going to stop? Mm, yeah, no, um, I would love to see some English guy play well in England. I think that'd be awesome. You know, that's always a great story. Mm. And then, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing a trend in Rory because I was on hand in Charlotte when he won. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm see, and I saw the game with Rory go there. I was on course with him in the first round. Well, he had some horrid shots, you know, mm -hmm. even though the technique was better and you could see him looking better on the range. 
he had some nasty looking shots on the golf course, but he got by those. He sort of chipped and putted his way to a score that was respectable and he kept himself in the tournament. And mm -hmm. then he sort of got a little better each day and obviously wins. And so that's always the key to me to winning is being able to get by that bad day. So I'm keen to see if Rory can sort of get by that bad day and, and, and get himself in the mix because I mean, but for the blink of an eye or two, he might've won in Torrey Pines too. So I'm, yeah. I'm also watching out for Rory. Yeah, I think the next month or so is going to be pretty big for him. It sounds like we're going to have a big crowd at the Open, which he obviously loves. And then going on to the Ryder Cup, which should be in September, is I think he's going to maybe spark that fire again, hopefully, for Rory. Definitely, definitely. I mean, the European team is, looks like it's stacking up pretty nicely now. The Americans mm -hmm. is like murder, murderer's row. I mean, they're, they're, they're also strong at the top, so, so that's going to be quite yep. the spectacle. Yeah, it should be a good one. Well, listen, Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you for your time again. For anybody that wants to find you, I mean, they can find you everywhere, but it's um, Mark underscore Immelman on Instagram, Mark Immelman on YouTube. You've got the On The Mark uh, Golf Podcast, which is available on Spotify and, and Apple Podcasts. Um, and then your website, I think is markimmelman.com as well, correct? That's correct. Yeah, you can find the vodcasts on the website there and um, on uh... On Twitter, I'm Mark underscore Immelman as well. So yeah, I'd, I'd love people to reach out to me. If you see me on a golf course, um, say hi. Um, if I can't talk to you, it's because I'm busy, but I, 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 I love the interaction. And I love to hear from folks that sort of say, hey, listen to the podcast. This one helped me. Because the more feedback we get, you know, the more it helps us to sort of chart our, our, our progress. So I appreciate that. All right, great. Well, thanks very much for your time, Mark. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you.